Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Three Easy Ways to Secure Your K-12 and Higher Ed. My name is Blair Singler, and I'm part of the cloud security team here at uh, Cisco in Canada. Appreciate you guys joining us today. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please ask them in the chat, and we'll address at the end. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Here's a quick look at our agenda. First, we're going to have a, have a look at some of the challenges you may be facing today. And we'll walk through three ways that you can secure your school district from cybersecurity threats and inappropriate content. We'll then take a look at how Cisco Cloud Security can help. Finally, we'll close out with some Q&A. Um, so please keep in mind we've got experts on the line to help answer your questions. So feel free to ask, uh, ask questions as we, as we go along. Let's, let's dive in. So today your students and staff have the freedom to learn in more places than ever, which wasn't always the case. In the past, everything was contained within your school walls, all of your infrastructure, school, laptops, applications, and students and staff. What's, what's changed? Well, first of all, there are more off-campus laptops and devices than ever. These devices, both school and student-owned, are accessing the internet from other networks. Next. Applications and infrastructure are moving to the cloud. Students and staff no longer need to connect to the school network to collaborate. They use cloud applications like G Suite, Office 365, and others, and access these applications from anywhere. Last, there are more, also more distributed school locations and, and district offices, meaning that you know, the more locations to protect, the more potential ways for threats to get in. So as a result of these changes, security challenges have also evolved both on and off campus. Uh, specifically, some of the, the challenges include uh, malware and other threats. Um, the threats continue to increase in sophistication and frequency, and, and despite existing security products deployed, everything from firewalls to web proxies to email security to endpoint products has still faced too many malware infections and phishing attacks. Secondly, the distributed campus model leads to gaps in visibility and coverage. As we think about it, with more locations and devices to protect, there's less visibility into who is accessing what, which means it's harder to protect. Thirdly, securing cloud collaboration applications such as G Suite. Students and staff use more cloud applications today, some approved and some unapproved. These applications are great for fostering collaboration, but organizations need to know which ones are being used and need to protect the data in those applications. Fourth, K-12 and higher ed is tasked with difficult to manage security and limited IT budgets. Security teams are often understaffed and struggle with complex systems that do not integrate or share information and intelligence. These teams need solutions that are easy to deploy, simple to manage, can scale, and can integrate with other tools. Lastly, maintaining compliance. Ensuring compliance with regulations that protect students from harmful online content is critical. And you really need a solution that enables you to block access to an inappropriate content easily and effectively. What's unique about the education space is it's really that 1% user. So 1% of users actually represent about 78% of the public exposures and 68% organ, organization-wide exposures. We take a look at you know, education in particular, um, some of the unique challenges that, that this space uh, faces, right? Entitled users, these students have grown up with, with technology and uh, um, are downloading applications frequently, right? We've got a massive amount of users. We've got things like cyberbullying that take place, right? Um, digital citizenship, very regulated environments as far as what can be accessed. We've got shadow IT with, you know, this explosion of OAuth tokens, which we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, how do you get some visibility into that? Limited resources, and, and then lastly, solution time to value. When we take a look at the third-party risk, you know, application and, and, and education, um, the explosion of high-risk applications, you know, is being led by K-12 and, and higher ed, uh, partly, in fact, due to, you know, um, users and, and students being, you know, growing up with, with these types of technologies and um, downloading a lot of risky applications, right? So we can see here a third of all the applications in education are, are high risk, right? And, and K-12 and, and higher education are leading the way as far as the average number of applications installed per user out of any sector. 
Now that we've covered some of the challenges you may be facing, let's get started with a look at the three ways that you can secure your school district. We'll talk about each of these in more detail. First, get up and running quickly. Secondly, simplify management and gain peace of mind. And third, eliminate the gaps in visibility and coverage across school sites. All right, so getting up and running quickly. First, when looking for a security solution to secure your environment, it's critical that you're able to get up and running quickly. By getting coverage in minutes, not months, you can improve productivity while simplifying student and staff collaboration and reducing your on-premise IT costs. This means that you'll be able to quickly secure student welfare on and off campus. The faster you're protected means the faster you can secure student records and any other sensitive data. Ultimately, you'll be able to get a quick return on your investment the faster you're able to effectively deploy a solution. The second item on our list is to simplify management and gain peace of mind. Even if you're able to get up and running quickly, that's not enough. You need intelligence so you can be proactive in your security as opposed to waiting for an attack to hit and remediating after the fact. Although threats continue to increase in sophistication, attackers often reuse the same internet infrastructure like web servers, IP addresses, and domains in multiple attacks, leaving behind what we call cyber fingerprints. What if you could use those fingerprints to identify emerging threats and attacks as they are staged and block them before they launch? Collaboration apps like G Suite, Box, Office 365 are great because they increase collaboration among staff and students. Schools need a simple approach to monitoring the usage of these cloud applications to ensure inappropriate content is not being shared or accessed. Ensuring schools aren't being put at risk with PHI and PAI information being shared, such as passport information, is crucial. Last, increasing visibility into the access scope that connected applications have in your environment. With OAuth, Open Authentication, it's become easier and easier to authenticate third-party applications in your corporate environment. And we want to ensure we're not giving applications a backdoor into the environment. We've talked about getting up and running quickly and simplifying management so you can gain peace of mind. Our last item on the checklist is to eliminate gaps in visibility and coverage. As we know, security needs have evolved along with the freedom to learn from many different locations and devices. By gaining visibility into all internet activity, whether it's on or off campus, you can better protect against threats before they've reached your network. You can also secure roaming students and staff effectively anywhere they access the internet. And with better visibility, you can deliver reliable off-campus coverage across the internet connected school and staff devices such as laptops and Chromebook devices. Now that we've reviewed the three ways to secure your school district, let's take a look at how Cisco Cloud Security can help. Cisco has the most robust security portfolio in the industry and a significant pillar within cloud security. We're able to cover off every aspect of cloud security, whether it's public cloud visibility, CASB, or DNS security. Extending visibility to public and hybrid cloud environments, securing users, data, and applications in the cloud, and protecting users wherever they go. Cisco Cloud Security secures all your networks anywhere you use them. Let's take a look at Cisco Cloud Lock, which really is taking a look at the secure usage of cloud applications. When we talk with school boards across Canada, um, the key questions that they typically have within K-12 and higher ed really revolve around three main buckets. Uh, users and accounts is typically the first one, so the UEBA type information. What are my students and staff doing in these cloud applications like G Suite and Office 365? How can I detect account compromises, right? Do I have one uh, account login coming from North America, you know, at 9 a.m. and then, you know, at 10 a.m. we have a, uh, you know, an account login at, at, in South Africa. So taking a look at where these account uh, logins are coming in from. Um, and then lastly, are malicious insiders extracting information out, outside of the, these cloud applications? So if we take a look at the second bucket, really that revolves around data. What type of data and regulated data is in the cloud? Do I have students or staff, you know, uh, sharing passport information, uh, you know, of, of these students in, in public cloud applications or with their personal emails? 
Um, how do I detect policy violations, uh, you know, within, you know, uh, if I see, you know, salary information or passport information, how do I detect that within these cloud applications? And lastly, the third party risky applications. So as I mentioned, as we start to see more and more cloud application uh, usage and adoption, um, st open standards like open authentication, um, we see more and more teachers and, and students authenticating to, uh, to games, to uh, risky applications with their corporate credentials. Uh, again, giving these applications far higher risky access scopes uh, than they should be allowed, right? Uh, things like acting on behalf of the user to send email on behalf of the user. Um, so how do you get in there and revoke these risky applications? So the first bucket we'll address, we'll talk to, is this UEBA, right? Really taking a look at the compromised accounts, the insider threats within your cloud applications. Here, here's an example of why you need cloud security, right? We've got uh, a user that's logged in, you know, in North America at 9 a.m. Um, and then maybe they went on a vacation, but, uh, you know, an hour later, um, you know, they're logging into to Africa, really. The velocity of that, that account login you know, within an hour time frame, right, just not, is not physically possible. So getting some visibility into the velocity of account logins globally is, is, is vital. Um, this is an example of, a, of a, uh, an assessment we did in an Argentinian bank, and it was, the account had been accessed in 68 different countries in one week. Um, so really, you know, getting an understanding of where these account logins are coming from do I have a potential account breach, um, right, that, that needs to be um, addressed? The second portion of this really is the DLP aspect of it. What uh, was my exposure level, right? Um, do I have compliance violations within these cloud applications? A good example of this is um, teachers or students sharing uh, files with a public facing link, really, right? And, you know, one of the first things that, that uh, unfortunately people do, right, they'll get a file, they'll share it with their personal email, right, and it puts the organization, the school board at, at risk. Uh, anyone with that link can access the, the document, really. So um, getting some visibility into what your exposure level is based on, um, you know, uh, public-facing links, um, organization-wide uh, facing links, and external collaborators. The last bucket uh, we'll, we'll take a look at addressing really is this, this uh, shadow IT, the apps firewall um, component. Let's focus on a recent and uh, a popular one, Pokemon Go. Um, really, if we take a look at the explosion of, of kind of, uh, you know, different technologies on the left-hand side here, we can see, you know, it took the, the telephone almost 100 years, right, to, to get 100 million users worldwide. Um, it took Pokemon Go one month to get 100 million users Right, so we see the explosion, the adoption rate of these, these applications. Um, why is that a bad idea, really, right? It, it had full account access, and what does that mean, right? Pokemon Go is authorized to act on behalf of the user, essentially through an OAuth connection. When launched, this OAuth connection allowed the application, and by extension, the vendor, Nintendo, to view, edit, collect, or delete anything related to the user's Google account documents, photos, emails, search history, location, contacts, and calendar. Um, they could send emails, analyze navigation history, exfiltrate and externalize users' data through programmatic API access. And they could collect personal data alongside geotagging functionality and camera access. All right, so just getting some visibility into what third-party applications are, are connected, what type of access they have within, within the environment. This is a, a quote from, from one of our educational institutions, the CTO, really just getting that better sense of, and that visibility, right, to be able to be proactive. It starts with getting that, that layer of visibility. Uh, so we'll, we'll move, we'll shift over to Cisco Umbrella, and this is all about secure access to the internet. Umbrella is a secure internet gateway <clears throat> that provides the first line of defense against threats on the internet wherever users go. So by analyzing and learning from internet activity patterns, Umbrella automatically uncovers attacker infrastructure stage for current and emerging threats and proactively blocks malicious requests before they reach your network or endpoints. 
With Cisco Umbrella, you can stop phishing and malware infections earlier, identify already infected devices faster, and prevent data exfiltration. Because Umbrella is built into the foundation of the internet and delivered from the cloud, it provides complete visibility into internet activity across all locations and users. Plus, it's one of the simplest security products to deploy and manage. Let's look at where Umbrella really fits within the security stack. If you think about where you enforce security today, you probably have a range of uh, different products already deployed. And, and because there are many ways that malware can get in, it's important to have multiple layers of security. Umbrella provides the first line of defense so you can block malware before it hits school sites or devices, contain malware if it's already hit your network, provide even faster internet access, provision globally in just minutes. So let's talk about how Umbrella works. With Umbrella, it all begins with DNS. And, and we use DNS as this main mechanism to get traffic to our cloud platform for inspection. Everyone's probably heard of DNS. Um, let's level set on what it is and why it's important within Umbrella. DNS is the domain name system. It's used to map domain names like cisco.com to an IP address, right? Think about when you wanna call your friend or, or your colleague, you look up their name in your contact list instead of trying to remember everyone's phone number. DNS was developed for a very similar reason. You, so you can, so you wouldn't need to remember the IP address of every website that you that you visit. Um, it's also the first step in nearly all all internet connections, and it's used by all devices. So with Umbrella, we're trying we're tying into something you're already doing. Anytime you click on a link or type a URL for an external site, the request goes to a recursive DNS service like Umbrella to look up the IP address. So Umbrella will resolve that DNS request plus add security at the same time, all without adding any latency. Um, in fact, many of our customers actually report better internet performance after switching to Umbrella. Umbrella provides enforcement without delay. We just reviewed how Umbrella uses DNS to enforce security, but how does this actually work? Uh, with Umbrella, when Umbrella receives that initial DNS request, it first identifies which customer the request came from and which policy to apply to that request. Um, next, Umbrella will determine if the request is safe or whitelisted, malicious or blacklisted or risky. For safe requests, we'll route the connection as usual. Malicious requests will route the connection to a block page. And for risky requests, we'll route the connection to our cloud-based proxy for deeper inspection. And Umbrella doesn't only protect against that initial infection, Umbrella also prevents command and control callbacks. So even if devices become infected, students or teachers take their devices off network, Umbrella blocks the communication to a, an attacker's server. So if that piece of malware is trying to reach out, grab you know, updated inst instructions, encryption keys, Umbrella is going to block that uh, connection from being made. Stopping data exfiltration or the download of ransomware encryption keys. C2 callbacks are blocked using the same DNS enforcement process described a moment ago. And in the event that the malicious play payload is designed to bypass DNS and use direct IP connection, Umbrella goes beyond DNS to provide malicious IP blocking and enforcement. Right. So you may be wondering what makes Umbrella's intelligence so powerful and how we're able to proactively identify threats. Uh, one key factor is that our view of the internet is like no other security provider. The Umbrella Global Network includes 30 data centers around the world that resolve over 175 billion DNS requests for more than 90 million users across 160 countries. Uh, we peer with over 100, sorry, 800 of the top ISPs and content delivery networks to exchange BG, BGP routes and ensure we're routing requests efficiently and not adding any latency over regional DNS providers. So not only do we have a massive amount of data, but perhaps more importantly, a very diverse set. It's not just from Canada, it's globally. This diversity really enables Umbrella to offer unprecedented insight into states and launch attacks, learning where the threats are coming from, who is launching them, where they're going to, and how wide the net of the attack is. In addition to our DNS data I just described, there are a few more factors that make up our threat intelligence. Let's start with a look at our data. Beyond DNS data, this also includes Cisco Talos feed of malicious domains and IPs based on 
Our researchers' analysis of millions of malware samples and terabytes of data collected from Cisco deployments worldwide. The second key factor is our security researchers. All right, they look at this data and they use advanced techniques like data mining and 3D visualization to identify patterns. They're constantly finding new ways to uncover fingerprints that attackers leave behind. And they build statistical machine learning models to autom automatically score and classify the data. And lastly, the models I just mentioned, these models continuously run against our data so we can uncover malicious domains, IPs, and, and URLs before they're even used in attacks. Our security researchers are always innovating and creating new models to provide better threat detection and classification. This is a quote from one of, uh, a recent Tech Validate survey that we did. Um, one of the respondents really highlighting after umbrella deployment, their institution saw a 75% reduction in malware tickets. So umbrella offers protection for all devices, Windows, Mac, um, you know, Chromebooks. Um, and you can easily point your external DNS request to the umbrella global network to get started right away. I'll talk more about this in a few slides, but I wanted to highlight the Cisco Umbrella Chromebook client, which provides DNS layer protection on and off the network for your Chromebook users. Um, because we see quite a few school boards across Canada taking up uh, a lot of Chromebook uh, de uh, deployments. Um, specifically, the Chromebook client provides protection for phishing. So really looking to protect against phishing threats automatically with Umbrella's global network data and predictive intelligence to discover internet infrastructure used to host phishing sites. So before employees or students ever receive the phishing email. Um, content category filtering. So really gaining some visibility and, and control over what type of content is being accessed on or off the, the school uh, premise. Um, <clears throat> lastly, per user visibility and policy. So being able to tie in with Active Directory to be able to um, apply policy on a per user uh, you know, basis really provides granular control and visibility. So with the Umbrella Chromebook client, you can easily provide visibility and policy control for users who have Chromebook devices. You can also create direct policies for all of your Chromebook users or just a small subset. Um, coming soon, the Umbrella Chromebook client G Suite integration will allow policies to be set by organization unit in addition to individual users. Um, this is another Tech Validate uh, survey respondent uh, who was able to better track student internet activity using Umbrella's Chromebook client. Um, I've mentioned our content filtering capabilities, right? We have over 80 different, uh, different categories within this uh, filtering ability, uh, and you can easily control and report on which sites can be accessed by students and staff. You can also create custom lists for which categories to block and allow, enabling compliance and ensuring an appropriate content can't be accessed. Let's now take a look at a few more reporting views. The identity reports enable you really to identify and review malicious internet activity per device or network as it happens in real time within your organization. Um, this really helps organizations, school boards to, to remediate potential victim, victims quicker. Uh, you can specifically pivot into uh, any identity, whether it's a network, uh, computer, or a user. You can also view top security destinations per identity, which can show what else might this you know, user be infected with. Um, you can see top overall destinations, which can give insight into what else is this user doing. Uh, you can also see the top security categories, which I'll dive into uh, more in the next slide here. So with the top categories report, you can easily see the most active categories by the number of requests going to these destinations. Uh, you can also see whether that request was blocked or allowed. The last reporting view I want to share is the app discovery report. And, and this enables you to gain visibility into cloud applications being used in your environment and block applications that, that may be unsafe, either by application name or the category. Um, so this report really provides some risk insight so you can make informed decisions about what applications uh, you want to allow and, and block depending on the level of risk. Um, using Umbrella's powerful reporting capabilities, this customer was able to identify malicious traffic they didn't even know existed.
So again, just getting that visibility, where's my internet traffic going, right? So you can uh, remediate potential infections quicker. All right, I mentioned earlier Umbrella's ease of deployment. So Umbrella is the easiest way to protect your users because it's delivered from the cloud. There's no hardware to install or software to manually update. Um, because we use the domain name system or DNS as the primary mechanism to get traffic to our platform, forwarding your traffic to us is as simple as changing one setting in your network devices. So for on-campus coverage, you can protect all devices, even if those, even those that you don't own, right, the BYOD devices, just by pointing your external DNS request to the IP address of our global network. Umbrella also integrates with uh, Cisco routers, 1K and 4K ISR devices. Uh, to provide protection to branch office users and the Cisco, Cisco wireless LAN to provide secure Wi-Fi. <clears throat> For off-campus laptop coverage, if you use AnyConnect, we have an integration with, uh, with that. So you can simply enable the roaming security module for protection when the VPN is off. Uh, if you're not using Cisco AnyConnect, we've got stand, uh, lightweight standalone agents that work with any VPN. Um, and they've been proven in over you know, millions of deployments. So um, lastly, we, we talked about the Chromebook clients and, and kind of, uh, you know, a lot of school boards moving towards kind of Chromebooks. So getting some visibility, being able to um, apply policy to those as well. All right, with this, I'm going to pass it over actually to, um, to Lundy. And uh, she's going to walk you guys through just a, uh, a sample report and... Um, I'll, I'll pass the ball over to Lindy. This is pretty much a CloudLock assessment. So typically after a two-week CloudLock POV trial, um, we'll actually create a report that will go over some of that information that we found, um, such as your account information, any of the data loss prevention, as well as any type of shadow IT. Um, so all the things that Blair that just covered earlier regarding CloudLock, uh, this is kind of a nice, pretty report that pulls in um, everything that we've, that we've been able to see. Okay. Um, so this is just a sample agenda. So again, we will typically go over some of those requirements and then go through each one of those steps of um, the account information, data loss prevention, and shadow IT, um, and then just pretty much answer any Q&A that you guys may have. Perfect. This just goes over some of the goals of the assessments, um, as we kind of mentioned here. So typically here during um, during this section, we kind of go over some of the policies that we were created. So things such as credit card information, social security numbers, um, whether there be any type of salary details or anything that's going to be more pertinent with what you guys are more focusing on. Um, some of those items may be some cyberbullying, so extreme aggressive behavior, um, wording, things like that. Those are also all policies that we can set up here. So what this is actually showing here, this is actually in our overview page, which is a quick high-level view of any of those type of anomalies. So again, Blair had given the, mention, um, the example of if you are in Canada and a user goes to um, Africa for vacation, but if, it's, if we see that type of information um, happening within the hour time, um, you know, Logically, that, that's just impossible for you to be able to travel from Canada to Africa within an hour, right? Uh, maybe after a few hours, possibly, but um, not in this particular standpoint. So this is where we can actually immediately see some of those types of anomalies, um, any type of suspicious logins. Um, you can quickly either resolve that if you do know that, hey, that is valid. We do know that they went to this particular location, uh, but at least kind of gives you that high-level view. This here is really talking about all of our failed login attempts. So the reason why this is really important is to notify whether or not you're having a brute force attack. Um, typically on average, a user maybe about five times um, may have a failed login attempt because they may forget their password. Um, I typically see this after a long weekend, um, but typically five times they should be resetting their password to hopefully they'll remember within um, you know seven days. Afterwards, um, if you see anything more than that, that could indicate some type of brute force attack, which means that you probably want to reset that password, take a deeper dive into what's going on there. 
Um, this is then just another sample of, for us to be able to see any type of a account login. So again, if we're seeing any type of login failures or success, where are those coming in from um, and whether or not we should also take a look at those if that's also another brute force attack or anything of that nature. Um, and then just some of our recommendations, right? So it's being able to have two-factor authentication. Um, that does allow us to have a little bit more hold over what kind of um, data and access that, you know, people who are just trying to brute force their way into those accounts. Um, also changing those passwords more on a regular basis, right? So not just when an attack happens or um, when they think that an account has been compromised, but maybe also, you know, implementing some type of changes maybe every quarter, every six months, every year, something like that, um, for us to be able to kind of change the password so it's not always the same thing. Um, and then also taking a um, more closeful eye on the service accounts as well as safeguard admins, um, just because they typically have slightly elevated um, access. So we just want to make sure that, you know, those accounts aren't compromised there. Um, so typically then we go into DLP, which is our data loss prevention. Um, with that, we're going to go over a few samples of those. So this particularly here is a sample of extreme and appropriate language. Um, so as you see, kind of blocked out some of the really nasty wording. Um, but what you can actually tell here is the exposure level as well. So whether or not that's shared publicly with a link, shared domain wide, or specifically to, you know, shared specifically with users. Um, so this can be a sample of a um, cyberbullying attempt trying to, you know, bully other students. Um, it could have been sent to another faculty or staff. So again, just kind of giving you some of that visibility. Um, you can even see the actual document if you wanted to see where this was located in the full breadth of this particular um, incident. Um, again, just another sample of extreme and appropriate language, um, again, sharing with specific people, um, but again, just kind of making sure that, you know, what, what's going on, what's being shared within your types of applications, as well as um, with your corporate logins. Um, so passports, you know, this is this is where we often see a lot of um, teachers, faculties, and staff where they'll actually either um, share these types of information with their own personal email accounts, thinking that, oh, if I need to have access to this in case, you know, um, they're going on a field trip, they need to have this type of information. Um, the biggest thing that why this was also flagged was because it was shared with a domain wide with the link, meaning that anyone within your domain, whether it be faculty or staff, unless you have them on two different domains, um, they would have access to this particular information, which means that you now have all their passport um, information. So it's a little bit of a confidential, um, a confidential breach. Um, this is an exposure of host passwords, so username and password to be able to log in, whether it be you know, you know, people's email addresses, uh, whether it be certain documentations, access to certain items. Um, again, domain with the link means that I can access this wherever, um, as long as I'm part of that particular domain, so I can see that particular document. Um, so this here is credit card information. So because of the way that we look at policies, um, we do them based off a of regular expression, so we're able to kind of tell um, the string of numbers with certain other wordings. We can also tell um, whether or not that's credit card versus just a string of numbers. Um, but the biggest thing here is that this was shared public with on the web, meaning that I don't even need to be a part of your domain. I can just uh, do a quick Google search and be able to open this particular type of uh, document. Um, same thing here is credit card information with social security numbers. Um, again, this is being shared publicly with the link, so not being a part of your domain, being able to access all that information. Um, we just want to be able to change those type of exposures. Um, and this here is exposing some of the salary details, social security numbers. So in the U.S. we have W-2s. Um, in Canada I know that's a, I think it's a T-2. Um, but again, it's just exposing, you know, the amount of money that someone's making. It will have social security numbers, um, where you're working, employees, things like that. Um, so again, domain-wide with the link means that anyone that's part of your domain would be able to have access to this particular document. So not sure if they maybe accidentally did that, maybe they were trying to share that with themselves, um, but you know, now everyone within their domain would be able to have access to this document. 
So those are just some examples of what we've seen and, you know, what, what a sample report could be and what we could maybe pull within, um, within your trial. What ends up happening is now the next question is, well, what can we do? We want to get rid of these items. We want to be able to mitigate, right? Um, so we do have immediate ex, um, exposure remediation where you can manually revoke those types of shares. Um, that also being said, we do also have an automated uh, remediation step. So then that means any type of future um, future sharing exposures where it actually states, you know, maybe it is public with a link. Um, those are things that you can automatically have a response action. So you don't always have to go into the CloudLock dashboard to be able to remove those types of exposure levels. Um, and then shadow IT, right? What are people um, using their corporate logins to have access to? So, um, with this particular page, you know, we're really looking at how easy it is for people to be able to do single sign-ons, to be able to utilize their corporate credentials, to be able to log into certain applications. Um, without the, the exposure of what exactly is this application asking for? Is this asking for full data access? Is it asking to be able to act on behalf of the user? Um, a lot of times, you know, most students, what they'll try to do is they want to play games, right? In some games, they'll ask for full data access. Um, why does it need to do that? So, I mean, those are things that CloudLock is able to kind of give you some of that visibility and also be able to revoke those types of um, sharing mechanisms. Um, this is just an example, again, on uh, the overview page for you to be able to immediately see the number of apps that you have within your application, I mean, within your environment, um, and also how many of those are what we deem as a high risk, meaning that they're asking for a lot of access based off of what they're needing to do, um, as well as what we call our trusted, uh, customer trusted ratings. Um, so meaning that those applications that other uh, CloudLock users have trusted and are um, allowing for their end users to use. Um, so again, this is just kind of giving you uh, some data, you know, could, those numbers obviously are going to vary based off of your particular environment, um, but we can see the number of applications that will have full data access, you know, want personal information access, that being able to act on behalf of the user, et cetera. Um, again, just another sample of, you know, what kind of information that you'll be able to see within the CloudLock dashboard. So I can immediately see all the applications that people have used their corporate logins to be able to log into. Um, so things like, for example, you know, Google Drive, that may be okay, and you can see the number of users have, that have actually installed that application. Um, but then maybe some of the other ones that you're unsure about, like, for example, the Cloudless platform, right? Maybe that's something that you don't want to trust. Um, those are things that you can kinda, uh, you can go through and you can revoke access. Um, you can see which user actually has it. Um, you can see the access scope that it's looking for, right? If it's asking for full data access, if it's asking um, to, be act, to act on behalf of the users, et cetera. Um, and this here is just some of the gaming, you know, just in uh, K-12, um, see a lot of games, um, especially from the student side of things. So again, we can also say that any type of games, right, we want to be able to revoke those types of access, um, or if that, if, you know, for them to use their own personal email addresses to be able to play these games. Don't use your school email address to be able to log into these types of um, applications. Um, so again, the remediation steps, um, we can also do any type of automated remediation. As you can see, we could also do any type of manual remediation, but very similar to the way um, for the data loss prevention, um, the type of responses that you want to be able to do is, is pretty similar on both, whether it be the shadow IT um, policy or if we're seeing it from the DLP policy side of it. So with that, that was just a sample report. Um, it is pretty easy for us to be able to spin up a trial. All it is is just based off of um, our API integration. It's about a less than 15 minute call. We kind of verify some things on the back end, um, and then we pretty much let it run, run through and we can generate one, a report like this for you guys. Okay, so that, uh, that concludes the webinar. Um, I don't know if we had any questions in the chat you can address. Um, I did have one question come in and they're asking about if there are any type of discounts for schooling or licenses here. Yeah, with both 
with both Umbrella and CloudLock, there's an educational pricing. So Umbrella has uh, an ADU SKU that um, uh, we're just looking at the number of faculty and staff. Uh, students uh, are, are at no charge. CloudLock um, is licensed a little bit differently, but we do have an education SKU for uh, for students. It's an add-on SKU, um, and, and students are heavily discounted uh, based on the amount of uh, users you have for you know the particular application, whether that's G, G Suite or Office 365. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, we'll uh, we'll conclude the webinar. Appreciate everyone joining today, and. Um, uh, thank you very much for your time.